Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we are delighted that you've welcomed us into your home. We certainly would love to hear from you. So send us an email with a question or a comment to jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, today we are very excited. First, I want to wish you all a blessed Amen. Advent as we begin this first week in Advent and we take this journey. Hopefully we are slowing down. We are staying awake. We are being prepared. We are keeping our ear close to mm. God's heart. Yeah. And that all of us, like the Blessed Mother, will say yes to him Amen. during this Advent season. Well, today our guest is Jim Tuohy. He is a trusted advisor and personal friend of Mother Teresa of Calcutta for 12 years. He's the author of a beautiful book called To Love and Be Loved. It's a personal portrait of Mother Teresa. And you can get this beautiful book at EWTNRC.com. Yeah. So if, if you have people out there that maybe they have, uh, they're a devotee to uh, St. Mother Teresa, you go to EWTNRC.com, get this book for Christmas. Yeah. It's a great gift to give. And Jim did an outstanding job. Season of Advent. Yes. The coming of the Lord. Preparing for the coming of the Lord. The second coming of the Lord the nativity of our Lord, but also a perpetual coming of Jesus Christ. Every day Christ is coming to us, according to Mother Teresa, according to Matthew 25, in the least. St. Paul was persecuting Christians. Jesus says, you're doing this to me. Mm. So Jesus is coming to us every day, and our husband, our wife, our children, our friends, our enemies. Are we looking for his face? Are we allowing him to mediate that relationship? Because that's how we respond to Jesus coming to us mm -hmm. daily is going to have a lot to do with the final judgment when we stand before the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. That the Lord separates the people. I was hungry, you fed me. Thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you came to me. I was in prison, you visited me. And, and there's a big part of the judgment. So God, grant us uh, the prayers of Mother Teresa, St. Mother Teresa, and bless Jim's sharing with us today that we could prepare to meet you now mm. as you come to us daily in our loved ones, in our families, in our friends, and in our enemies. And may we respond somehow, some way, by your grace and mercy and the power of the sacraments, the, the way you would have us to do so. A beautiful theme for this Advent season. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. You're not going to want to miss this very special show. Don't go away. Welcome back while well, you're at home with Jim and Joy. And today our guest is Jim Tuohy. He is a trusted advisor and personal friend of Mother Teresa of Calcutta for 12 years. He's the author of a beautiful book, To Love and Be Loved. And it's a personal portrait of Mother Teresa. And Christmas is coming. And you can get this book at EWTNRC.com. And it's a beautiful book and it's filled with great personal pictures, absolutely beautiful. And new kind of revelations yes. and information, mm -hmm. especially from the sisters there nearing the time of Mother's uh, passing. So hopefully you're going to speak about that and what Mother was, how Mother was dealing with, with aging and not being able to serve as she would like to serve, being served, and, and uh, maybe some of her final words and thoughts. So it's really incredible. Yeah. Well, we are delighted to have you, Jim. So tell our family first a little bit about yourself and then how you got connected with St. Mother Teresa. Well, well, long story, <laughs> but uh, Mary and I have been married for 30 years. We have five children and three grandchildren, and uh, we live in the D.C. area. And we were both in the D.C. area when we met in Mother Teresa's home for people with AIDS. Uh, but years previous to that, when I was working on Capitol Hill, I was a very disillusioned uh, token Catholic uh, and... 
I saw Mother Teresa from afar living her faith, and so I decided why not uh, go and meet her for one day. I had to go across the world for the senator I worked for, and I thought on the way back I'd meet her for a day, and I did. And it was a turning point in my life. I met her the week she turned 75. Oh my God! She was just incredible. She bounded out for the meeting like a schoolgirl. She had all this energy, all this focus, and and love of life. She was everything I wasn't. So yeah, it was a turning point, and then it led to me doing legal work for her, and then I ended up living in her AIDS home, and then that led to a long 37-year relationship with the Missionaries of Charity and, and this book. Yeah. Well, but you, now when you went there, you kind of thought you were going to be like taken on a tour. Right. But what she did was she took you and she showed you the sick and the dying. It was like, come and see. And then what happened to your heart? Well, she told me to go see Sister Luke, and I went there to the Home for the Dying, and Sister Luke, as you said, thought I was there to volunteer, and <laughs> I was there for the tour. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have gone. Mm -hmm. I had no interest in touching the poor. So it was actually pride that led me to that first bed mm -hmm. and yeah. first contact, and, yeah. and then it was transformative. I mm -hmm. mentioned to you before we came out for the show that as we were reading your book, you know, thinking about your own life, we don't want to spend too much time on you instead of mother, but, um, you know, that, that you, Zacchaeus, that's who came to mind for me. <laughs> I said, this is about, it's like Zacchaeus, who was a child of Abraham. He was a Jew, but he was a chief tax collector, really just revolting to the people of that time and probably revolting to himself. But um, he heard this, this miracle worker, a holy rabbi was coming to town. He climbed up the tree. He just wanted to see him, okay. see somebody different than himself. And Jesus says, you know, I'm staying at your house tonight. I thought that was you because you share in the yeah. openings of your, your book, you know, you're a Catholic guy, you know, you're a child of the church, yet you're not living church, you're not living Jesus. And at least that was, you were grappling with that to some degree. And as you're working, you know, within the government system for that particular senator, um, you know, you had opportunities. I want to meet this lady who does, you yeah. know, live it. Yeah. You know, maybe something, maybe something good will happen to me. And like you said, uh, you know, when you, you met her, well, your life was just changed because of her, but God's grace and mercy moving through her. You said, she was everything I was not. I bet Zacchaeus said the same thing. Yeah. This guy is everything I'm not. I really want to be a child of Abraham. Yeah, well, I, when you mentioned it to me, I thought, yeah, the parallel with Zacchaeus that fits is that I was short of stature. <laughs> uh, but what didn't fit was I wasn't giving half of my wealth to the poor, and I wasn't, you know, I did not have any real relationship with the poor. And, uh, and so I, I was, I, and I think what you saw in Mother Teresa when you met her was that she, she radiated Christ. This mm -hmm. was the prayer she prayed every day, that, she, that, it would, that people would look up and see no longer her but only mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so uh, wow. that experience was captivating to me. And when I got back to Washington and I met her sisters there because Mother had told me to go say hi to them, uh, they then said, why don't you come work in the soup kitchen? And then I was introduced to the spiritually poor, these mm -hmm. people in the, that were on drugs and had difficulties homeless in their life, and to see the poverty, which Mother said was this fundamental need to love and to be loved. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that and you feel unloved, unwanted, unwelcome, it's a terrible poverty. Yes. You know, as a, as a woman, you know, my daughters would say, oh, Mom, who do you think is the most beautiful person in the world? What beautiful woman, you know? And, you know, you think of movie stars and everything, and I would say, Mother Teresa is beautiful. Mm -hmm. She never had a manicure, never had a pedicure, <laughs> never had a facial, but it was her, like you said, it was that interior radiance, yeah. right, that was coming from her, that, that drew you and you said, I, I need to see, I need to know what she's doing and how she's doing. But you then became her attorney. Why did she need an attorney? <laughs> <laughs> she liked to sue people. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Well, she, people were trying to use her name to make money. Uh, she was needing help with them, uh, visas for her Indian sisters that were coming into America to staff her homes. And she also uh, was opening AIDS homes, that was, and those homes were opposed by local governments. And so just a lot of bureaucratic work, and I was happy to be in the right place at the right time. She had other attorneys that had helped her in the past. Diane Landy in New York had done some estate work for her and other things. So there were always people that were seen to be there when Mother needed them, and I was in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And you stayed with her for 12 years. I worked on and off. I was full-time two years with the Missionaries of Charity and uh, had the privilege to travel some with her mm -hmm. uh, and be with her in Calcutta, Mexico, in the U.S. Uh, at a bunch of homes, but also uh, 
in the other years, I still was a phone call away. I, can, I called Mother in Albania and Rome and mm -hmm. places where she'd be traveling to get sign-offs, clearances. So she was always, uh, she's a missionary, so mm -hmm. she was on the go, and it was just, it was always a privilege to hear her over the phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, the title for the book, To Love and Be Loved, is not just simply a title. It really was part of her vision, her life kind of words to love, and love is just such a, a word that's used in so many ways. I think of agape love in mm -hmm. particular here, that, that love that sees something infinitely precious, mm -hmm. infinitely precious in another. And to be loved, that's nice too, because there's sometimes we could be so good and so busy loving that we think we don't need to be loved. <laughs> but it's really coming out of that divine affirming, gracious love of God to us and to some other people that love us, who even know who we are and love us anyway. Yeah. That the touches and we can love. Yeah, and it was beautiful to watch Mother as she aged and allowed herself to be loved, you know, much more directly by her sisters. I mean, there are, there are such close bonds between Mother mm -hmm. and those women and the priests that joined her and, and have lived these lives out in all corners of the world to, to serve uh, the gospel. But when Mother was sick and needed help, she had her sisters there ready to spoil her. Mm -hmm. And she liked chocolate. And mm -hmm. she, you know, she liked to laugh. I mean, Mother was very human. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book was I wanted to make sure yes. that it wasn't, we don't turn into a plastic statue, that right. we see her humanity shining out in, in her motherhood. She really is a, is a, I think, a tremendous standard barrier for maternity. You wouldn't think that from a virgin, mm -hmm. sister, religious, consecrated, and yet there she was, virgin and mother like Mary of Nazareth. And... Uh, and her maternity really shone through with her sisters, and they loved her back. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you knew the woman behind the saint, A little right? bit, yeah. And what were some of your favorite memories of her? Well, it's funny. I mean, I watched her in so many meetings. She had exceptional judgment, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I dealt with worldly affairs. Like when they did the canonization process, I was one of the 113 people that the Vatican interviewed, and, uh, and so they want to know about worldly matters. And so I... I talked about some of these legal issues that she faced. But for me, the memories that stuck out was when I was running out on an errand for her after early morning mass, and she came running to the door after me to say, you didn't eat breakfast, and she put a banana mm -hmm. and a, sa a peanut butter sandwich in my pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the little things that she did. She was so motherly. She was solicitous of Mary with the children, and and when she saw them, you know, I remember her being in her wheelchair at the end. This was 10 weeks before she died, and it was the last time I saw her. And I'd finished a long business meeting, and th the meeting was adjourning. And I said, Mother, can the kids come up? They were on the ground floor, two mm -hmm. floors below. I said, Mother, can they come up and get your blessing? And before I could say that, Mother just jumped up from her chair. I mean, she mm -hmm. was in her wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And she looked out, she said, where are the children? Just mm -hmm. like that, you know, like mm -hmm. she still had this childlike heart. I'll never mm -hmm. forget that, that mm -hmm. she... She, that's the, that's the life lived for others. That's the benefit you get from a life lived yeah. for others. Mm -hmm. She had a childlike heart. I remember watching, yeah. you know, mother, watching St. John Paul II as they were aging and, and moving towards death and being able to see their spirits and say they're young. The uh -huh. spirit doesn't age. I mean, yeah. that, that they're so young. And especially with John Paul, his frustration with his body. Yeah. And his body was just not keeping up. It was really frustrating. Yeah. Was it like that? Well, you said she accepted her aging and so on, but I would imagine that was a process too. Sure, it was. And she had five heart attacks, and she was hospitalized a lot. And you know, and I, Sandy McMurtry and I were with her in 1996 when she was in her hospital room in Calcutta, and uh, you know, was not expected to live. And there, in front of her bed, directly in front of her bed, she had the Blessed Sacrament there in the tabernacle. She had an icon of Our Lady of Guadalupe. She had a photo of the St. Therese, a little flower, just directly in front of her. Mm -hmm. She had her bearings. She knew she came from God and she was going home to God. And so she had made, when I saw her, I said, Mother, the, the last time I said, Mother, I'm going to miss you so much. And she said, well, I have my bags packed. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like she was ready. Yeah. And I, just, I detail that in the book about how she prepared. Right. And so in, in her preparing, what did she teach you? Well, she taught me the beauty of the present, not to mm -hmm. be worried with regrets and things about the past and not living in the future. She was very present to the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, was, uh, she taught me about uh, the eternal home of the Father mm -hmm. that awaits us, the importance of the Eucharist. She was very Marian. Mm -hmm. She said Our Lady begged her to start the Missionaries of Charity. 
So she was very childlike in her faith, which is why I think like the Little Flowers, she may ultimately be a doctor of the church because in her writings and her teachings to her sisters, there's real profound messages through very simple theology. So mm -hmm. I think Mother teaches us all to uh, be oriented that we're going home to God and that's a journey we're on. You know, and especially in this culture, you know, and you watch the movies and the documentaries on her and here she is holding these, you know, babies, tiny, infant babies, yeah. tiny babies. And then she's with the elderly and dying, right. uh, crippled and dying, and she's and and bringing them both yeah. dignity, value, and worth, and saying they're alive, and yeah. we get to touch them and love them yeah. and to minister to them. Yeah. And you got to see that firsthand. Yeah, she saw the divine imprint on those people she picked up from the streets, the mm -hmm. lepers and others, and she loved them all. They were all children of God to her. Muslims, Jews, Hindus, didn't matter. She usually was. She grew up in a non-Christian minority as a non as a Christian minority and uh, I think that, that really framed on her that these people were in the image and likeness of God and she always saw that image divine image in them mm -hmm. did, when did she understand this because you didn't understand it and I didn't understand it grow understand it being the mystical unity of Christ with every human being and that when you touch somebody you're touching him that mm -hmm. like that hasn't happened for many people, even though we're in the church. Did she always have that? Was she just reared in that? What, 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 yeah. Well, was that there a particular Matthew, time it came to her like that? Yeah, Matthew 25 was obviously a very important scripture to her. And she used to take, I remember when she married the Attorney General Janet Reno, she took her hand and she said, you did it to me. Mm. And she said she would do her own examination of conscience and look at her hands and how did she... How did she touch people that day and what did she do with her hands? I mean, Mother was very simple but very focused on Jesus, the person of Jesus in the poor. She said it, Jesus in his distressing disguise of the poorest of the poor. And so that's why, yeah, if she was feeding someone, if she was clothing someone or listening to someone, you know, she saw that people had been stripped of their dignity that had not been accepted, not been welcomed, had been unloved, unwanted. She saw that terrible spiritual poverty in the United States, yeah. which she said was harder to touch. Mm -hmm. Being in union, so to speak, with the grief of the Creator mm. for His children and yeah. Jesus, and that, when that gets your heart, yeah. and that it, it got got her heart. This was this was personal with her. Yeah, it was. That's why on every crucifix, there's I thirst right next to the crucifix, and all of her missionaries of charity which was revealed to her on her train ride in 1946 that made her go into the streets. And it was the communication of Jesus' thirst for love and for souls. And that animated her whole religious life. And we, she started that as just a single right. nun that walked out on the street, That's nobody right. with her. And there she went, which had to have courage. Yeah. I mean, you know, anything could have happened to her. That's right. And she went out in boldness and That's in right. love and in hope that, you know, she could do something. You can't solve all the ills of the world, but you can love another human being. That's right. And that's what she did. And I go into the book a fair amount about the early beginnings because that was a remarkable thing, as you said, Joy. I mean, the courage it took for a woman in the late 1940s mm -hmm. to go out there and then to have others join her and start an order in a rented room. Then she had 26 women in this tiny little space on the third floor with one bathroom, mm -hmm. which I think was her first miracle. You had 26 women, one bathroom. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> you know, she was, she had such faith because she felt clearly that Jesus called her to this work. And I think the church is going to unpack those visions she had and see them as Margaret Mary's were, mm -hmm. St. Margaret Mary's were. We just have about a minute left, but go from that early beginning to where it is now for, for this order the numbers, the countries, how did, how was it grown? Well, from her initial start, and then she had 12 by the, by 1950. Uh, by the time of her death in 1997, she had 3,850 women that had joined and dozens and dozens of priests and in formation. And then uh, at this time, they have 5,100 sisters. 5, and they're in 139 countries. And mother died, it was 120. So they continued mm. to expand. She's had uh, three successors. Now Sister Joseph is the superior general after Sisters Nirmala and Prema followed her. So it's remarkable for an order that's not even 75 years old to have grown so fast and so beautifully and the sisters are still doing the most difficult work in the poorest places mm -hmm. of the world.
Mm. Jim, thanks so much for opening up about your own personal encounter with Mother and your wonderful book, To Love and Be Loved. Glad we have tomorrow mm. to unpack this more fully. And hopefully we will learn not simply to look at this and to admire Mother, but to say, what are you calling me to? Mm. Maybe, as you said in your book, I can't be like a Mother Teresa or the sanctity she had. I could be a better person. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you're enjoying uh, this time, and we'll be right back. There's plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. We're at home with Jim and Joy. And believe it or not, Father John Paul is here. And I just said, Father, I can't even remember the last time you were here. He's in demand. He's, He's in all demand. over the place. But you're <laughs> here today and we're ever so grateful. Well, what did you think about our beautiful conversation with Jim Toohey? I started listening to the audiobook version of this. And it's, it's great when you can listen to a book by the author itself mm -hmm. because you get a good idea um, because he's, he wrote the book, he's, his passion, his love was, is within this book and communicating the message that you know, he desired to tell the world. Um, you know, Mother Teresa, you know, I say Saint Mother Teresa, but Saint, Ma, Saint mm -hmm. Teresa of mm -hmm. Calcutta. Um, it's a saint that we all knew. It's a saint that we have heard her voice, we watched her on TV, mm -hmm. and we, we remember when she died. Most people remember uh, probably uh, Princess Diana mm -hmm. dying. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa died right. very, you know, close to her death. So, um, you know, there's so many things about her life I could, you know, talk about. I'm glad that he mentioned the five-fingered gospel. Mm -hmm. you, know, you did it to me. Mm -hmm. You know, that we can look down at our hands, that meditation. We have two of them, by the way. We have two hands. Mm -hmm. You know, so you did it to me times two. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, one story that, uh, you know, it's real brief that, um, you know, mother and the sisters in, uh, encountered a man in Calcutta who literally, he had trash piled up on him because so many people had been uh, walking past him forever. And um, it didn't even look like a human being laying on the ground. And the, the sisters got wind of this man and uh, they went out and they picked up him, the man. And at that point he had... Uh, maggots eating at its flesh mm. and uh, they cleaned him up um, and uh, he said uh, before he died he said you know I was treated like an animal um, I was walked upon I was walked over forgotten about but now I'm gonna die like an angel mm. these sisters are gonna treat me like an angel mm. and then he died shortly after mm. the sisters yeah. cleaned him up and brought him in and that's how we're to treat people right Amen. ultimately everybody the unborn, especially. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the unborn earlier. Especially, Mother Teresa would say that. You know, people that didn't want their babies, Mother Teresa would say, give them to me. Right. Yeah. I'll take care of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll find them a home. Well, hopefully in our age and in our time, 25 years or so since her passing, so many people have no recollection of her, 25 years old, that, that sure. she will take to heart her life and her message once again that all together we will build a new culture of life. Would you close us in a prayer and with a blessing? Sure. Family, through the intercession of St. Mother Teresa, may the blessing of Almighty God be upon you this day, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, family. Thank you. Thank you Wonderful to be with you again today. Blessed Advent to you, preparing for the second coming of the Lord, the nativity of the Lord. But we're hearing through Jim Tui and his personal encounter with Mother Teresa that she makes us aware that every day Jesus is coming to us. Mm -hmm. Every day. And what we do or do not do to them has eternal significance. Dear God, help us. Fill us with your grace and mercy that we would look for your face in every face. That we would allow you to do the mediation you want to do in this relationship. Not only in Calcutta, Mother Teresa said, Calcutta is in your town. Cal Calcutta is in your home. Mm. So to love everyone everywhere 
all the time. God bless you and all of your loved ones. Bye now.